Hello, welcome to the world of Word. Coming up, another word in your attic. And if you enjoy this, visit our Patreon to find out more about our exclusives and our general work of national importance. The link is in the notes below. And now, on with the show. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Right, well, welcome to another Word in Your Attic. We're delighted to be joined by best-selling, uh, best-selling author Ian Rankin. Hello, Ian. How are you doing? I'm Terrific very to well. see you. Fantastic. Where do we, where do we find you? Uh, in what's called my listening room. So I could take you on a little tour. Uh, it's basically it's a one-bedroom flat. It's now my office. So the living room, which is the next room over, is where I write, and this is where I come to relax. There's a sofa a lot of CDs and LPs and a ridiculously big hi-fi system. And that's it. Could it, could it be said that, uh, you know, a crime writer, my ex- uh, friends who are crime writers tend to write at night and obviously it's a solitary uh, occupation by, by definition, but has lockdown changed your life or have you simply carried on doing broadly what you do anyway? Um, everybody's different. I mean, I've found it easy to write, but difficult to read. So yeah. I find, you know, focusing on a book that I'm reading, I'm finding tough. Uh, a few pages and my mind wanders elsewhere, but I've actually managed to write or finish a new novel during lockdown, finish it, edit it, proofread it, um, and that's coming out in October. So this is what writers do. We sit in splendid isolation away from our fellow human beings, um, living inside our heads and very happy in a small uh, space as long as we've got access to a computer. So you're one of those people who likes to go somewhere to write, though. This, this is, you know, it happens yeah. with many people. You, 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 you go out of your home, you go somewhere else. Well, we, we're lucky. Now that I've got a bit of money, we've got a second home way up in the north of Scotland in a little fishing uh, town called Cromarty, which you'll know from the, the shipping forecast. Yes. Uh, yeah. And that's yeah. usually where I go to write the books. Well, this book was started there. And then I came back to Edinburgh and the lockdown happened. And because Cromarty is a couple of hundred miles away, I couldn't drive there. So normally the book would mostly be written in this little place that has no mobile phone signal, no TV, no nothing. Um, One shop, uh, one cafe. Uh, But instead of, I was forced to write it in this this, uh, office and it was fine. It was absolutely fine. You know, I've got my coffee and tea. I've got music playing in the background. I just start writing. Do you Can play you... certain records when you're writing? I have to know this. Yeah, instrumental, oh. instrumental stuff. It's got I was to... going to say because yeah. most people simply cannot concentrate no. if they hear any lyrics at all. No, I mean, is there any? Lyrics. Are there any lyric albums that you can you can cope with? Uh, yeah, the Cocteau Twins, because I can't make out a word. Right. Right. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Pearly G drops drops. I know. No, I know. So I'm, I'm okay with them. But usually it's stuff like Eno, Brian Eno. Is yes. Uh, Tangerine Dream, uh, Boards of Canada, some jazz, maybe a little bit of classical. It's really just creating a bubble yeah, no, in which yeah. it's just me and the story and the outside world has ceased to exist. Yeah. It's strange that Brian Eno never got round to, write, to making an album called Music for Writing. I, and yet all these, all these uh, ambient albums are fantastic. I just got a six CD box set of his, uh, Music for Installations. And every single one of those is brilliant for writing to. And I just got his latest one is with his brother, uh, uh, is it Roger? And again, yeah. that's really good, really good ambient album. He's, I mean, I, I bumped into him once in Edinburgh. All right. uh, I was at a, a concert of Russian carols in a church in George Street in Edinburgh near Christmas with my wife. And at the end of the concert, there was a little tap on my shoulder and I turned around and this guy behind me said, hello, I'm Brian Eno. Oh, that's good. <laughs> no, I mean, yes, you are. You want, you want that to happen, very much. <laughs> yes, Brian you Eno are. Has, he has a choir nearby where I live, just yep. in Notting Hill here, called called the Elgin Marvels. Isn't yep. that a great name for a choir? <laughs> we <laughs> talked about that. We did talk about that. And oh, the reason yeah. he was at the concert was that his daughter, who lives near Edinburgh, is also in a choir, and that's who was performing at this concert. Oh. So he'd come up from London to see his daughter perform. Um, and it was lovely, and he sent me a signed album afterwards. Oh, uh, very that, good. That's the he, kind of meeting that you want, unlike what we're going to talk about in a minute, because Mark right. Ellen, I've got a Mark Ellen story coming Oh, right. oh, God. oh, oh God. God, we'll move straight straight on oh, to no. a Mark Ellen story. Come on. We've we asked you to put, put aside <laughs> a few things to show and tell. I have, I have. What would you like and, to start with? Well, uh, let's start with, this is the Mark Ellen story coming up. 
so I'll take it out of its glossy, shiny wrapper. Um, Hard knows the highway. Van Morrison signed. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Signed uh, to Ian, all the best, Van Morrison. Uh, my favourite Van Morrison album. It's oh, not really? many people's. Yeah, it was the first one I really got into. The first one I properly listened to, and I've always loved it. So, now, Mark Ellen had a book out a while ago, and he came to Edinburgh to promote the book at Blackwell's Bookshop, and I went along. You and did as I was as, as I was waiting to to get my book signed by him, we had a little chat, and the name Van Morrison came up, <laughs> Which and does. and Mark Ellen said. <laughs> There are two kinds of people in this world, <laughs> those who like Van Morrison and those who've met him. And I said, I'm having dinner with him next week. Oh, very good. And, and you're going to tell me that he was an absolute he sweetheart. Was, he was Paid the bill. He, he, <laughs> he did, or his management did anyway. Um, and it was because um, he was aware that I was a big fan of his music from the various mentions I've given it in the Rebus novels. And he was, he wanted me to do the introduction to his collected lyrics, uh, which Faber were about to publish. So we had a little chat, a little meeting, went to the gig that night uh, that he was playing in Edinburgh, got him like a house on fire. So he decided that he would take it on the road. So me, me interviewing him on stage live before he did a full band performance. We did it in London, Belfast, Dublin. Um, and it was, it was a joy. I mean, it was a nerve wracking joy. <laughs> It's nerve wracking it? because you're never sure which Van Morrison is going to turn up. You see, this is always precisely interviewing any kind of rock star in front of an audience. The, there's a devil inside them that means occasionally <laughs> they just want to pretend that they're not going along with it at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the, yeah. And the, and the person who'll end up embarrassed is the, is the presenters. <laughs> yeah. And when we did it in London, it was only, I think, 10 or 15 minutes on stage. And then afterwards, he said, uh, I really enjoyed that. Let's do it again, but we'll do it longer. So we went to Dublin and did 20 minutes, half an hour. And he was full of anecdotes. He was engaging. The audience were in tears because they'd never heard them speak before at length. Yeah, right, right, right. We're still talking about Van Morrison, right? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but then we hit Belfast. And in Belfast, I think he was home turf. Uh, lots of school friends in the audience and he just he was maybe a bit nervous or he just yeah. he just clammed up he wouldn't tell the stories i kept teeing up all these great anecdotes and he just refused to go along didn't with it. a really funny thing happen when he went into that pub <laughs> that's right yeah i, I think it involved a pint of beer and some peanuts dear, yeah dear, dear, Let, dear. let's talk i think it was let's talk about them you know your the belfast band oh i was in bands before them you know and he just wouldn't talk about it i'm going oh my god it's awful when people won't cooperate in that way. I know exactly. I know exactly the feeling. But also with Van Morrison, quite rightly you say, he is nervous. I think that's always been his issue. He's quite shy. Mm. He's nervous in front of crowds. You know, he's never found a way of just being in front of a crowd and being himself. But, you know, touring with him, I mean, I'd heard a lot of the stories that, that you guys will have heard as well. You know, you're not allowed to look at him backstage or talk to him or any of that kind of stuff. Nonsense. Nonsense, you know. Backstage, right. the, the band were basically telling him, this is how we're going to do it tonight and stuff yeah. like that. And yeah. you're going, wow, this isn't what I expected. Uh -huh. um, and, and after the, the gigs, he was always delightful. We'd go for drinks or go for dinner. And he was, he was relaxed and chatty. Um, and I've seen him play many, many, many times. And he's, every night is different. You know, every night his mood may have changed. The atmosphere may have changed. There might have been something going on. Um, but he's, he's definitely a much more relaxed performer on stage now than he used to be. I mean, you hear stories of gigs where he just played with his back to the audience. Oh, I've been to those. Oh, absolutely. You don't <laughs> get that around. anymore. And in fact, I think almost the last gig I saw him play, which I think was in Edinburgh, I was with a friend who hadn't seen him live before. And I said, look, he doesn't do encores. When he's doing Gloria and he picks up the remote mic and he walks off stage, he's into the car, off to the airport. We can leave. So he starts Gloria, he starts shuffling off the stage. I went, right, we can go. Let's get to the pub. Last <laughs> he comes back. We're, we're halfway to the back of the auditorium. When he comes Ladies back on, he comes back on <laughs> and does an encore. I'd never, I said, I've never seen him do an encore before. <laughs> oh, Half the audience were left too. That's, that's, fantastic. that's brilliant. That's fantastic. Yeah. What else have you got there? So what have you got to show us? Yes, come on. Um, what have I got? Okay, uh, where shall we start? Um, well, I mean, you're talking about heroes. Again, this is in a shiny wrapper, but... Uh, oh, I get it. Okay. Oh, okay. wonderful. So this Rory's um, uh, brother, Donal, who keeps the Rory Gallagher uh, name and music alive and kicking, um, 
got in touch. He said, look, you mentioned Rory a lot in your books. You must be a fan. I'm trying to put, he was a huge fan of crime fiction. Rory was a huge fan of especially American golden age crime fiction. When he went on tour, you would open up one of his guitar cases and it would be full of paperback books. So he said, I'm going to put together an album of songs of Rory's that actually were influenced by the crime novels and thrillers that he read. And he asked me to get involved and I wrote a 1930s set LA private eye story that would shoehorn in as many references to Rory Gallagher songs as I possibly could. Um, and, and then we got a, a comic book illustrator who also did the cover. We got him to sort of illustrate the, the story. And then we got the actor Aidan Quinn uh, to read the story out on CD3. So this beautiful, it's like a book. There's a little kind of the stories in there with all the yeah, yeah, yeah. and everything. Um, and that was a lovely thing to get involved with. And to sit there with Donal um, Gallagher, just hearing story after story of Rory Gallagher, an artist I never saw live. Right. Now, I, gr I grew up in, in a little mining uh, village in, in Fife and Edinburgh was a long way away and family didn't have a car, anything like that. If we wanted to go to a gig, uh, when we were 16, 17, 18, we would organize a bus or a minibus and we'd go to Edinburgh. So one day we'd organize the bus. Half the bus were going to see Genesis do Wind and Wuthering. Oh, yeah. And half the bus were going to a different venue to see Rory Gallagher. <laughs> Guess which half I was in. Oh, you were you're in Gen Genesis. Genesis. Oh. Post, I'm surprised you didn't see him because, in fact, there was a period when if you went to any kind of festival or whatever like that, Rory Gallagher would turn up, invited yeah, or not, and play bull, Bulldog. I don't. Do, can't do festivals. Can't. Do oh, festivals. you like me? You've never oh, done a festival. Man. Dave Hepburn, I don't think he's ever been to a festival. No, no. I have. Only, been only, only, only one. professionally. Yeah, I, I loathe festivals. Why do you hate them so much, Ian? Um, crowds. Uh, no, no convenience. There's no. You're queuing for the toilet, queuing for a drink, queuing for everything. Sleeping in a tent. Um, lots of bands you're not interested in, and a few that you are. Uh, just, you know, surrounded by people you don't know that you probably don't like. Uh, the weather's always... You're rubbish. selling it to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Where do I sign? <laughs> I love that you don't like crowds. That, that would be a real problem. If you don't like crowds, then a festival yeah. is not going to work. Yeah. I like, I like it when bands are small, you know, before they get big. You yeah. know, going, to, going to see you 2 before they were filling stadiums. That's my kind of gig. Or so where, where, did, where did you see you 2 Can you remember? Did you do that? I think it was, it was, um, oh, was it Clouds? No, was it Clouds? It was a venue in Edinburgh that was basically a roller, a roller skating rink. <laughs> right. and, and sometimes it was a roller skating rink and sometimes they put bands on. And um, it's still going. It's a nightclub now. It's a sort of, um, it's a nightclub at Toll Cross in Edinburgh. And I hardly, I mean, the band's first album had just come out and a friend of mine who was sharing a student flat with me said, oh, I've got a spare ticket for this band, you too. Um, and I went along and they just blew me away, you know, right. I just thought they were phenomenal. There was so much energy in the room, probably a couple of hundred there. Yeah, it, yeah. Was ja it was jammed, but it was a couple of hundred, yeah. which brings me to another story, actually. Go on, go on. Um, because it wasn't the same friend, it was a different friend, but they said to me once, um, oh, hey, I'm going to see uh, the Buzzcocks play at the Odeon. Uh, I've got a spare ticket, come along. And I went, and they just turned up at the door. You know, it was the evening of the gig. It was about an hour before the gig. And I said, no, I'm writing an essay. I was at uni, I was doing my English literature degree. I can't, I've got an essay to write. This is also why I missed Frank Zappa in Glasgow when I was at high school, because I had an exam the next day. Um, they said, oh, but this new band that are amazing are, are supporting them, Joy Division, you've got to come. And I'd never heard of Joy Division. No. Uh, and I said, no, it's okay. Uh, well, the next day I went out and bought the Joy Division album and I thought, these guys are amazing. The first album, Unknown Pleasures. These guys are amazing. Um, and they were coming back to Edinburgh to headline a gig. And it was at the Astoria, which was a lovely wee venue. Um, and there's the ticket. All uh, right. Ha and how much? How much was it? That is £2.50. Oh, quite really? pricey. In yeah. your new money. Uh, so what, we, when was, are we talking about? That was early May 1980. Right, right. Oh, I think and I can see where this story's going. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Lord. The gig, the gig that never happened because yeah. Ian Curtis had committed suicide. Oh, really? That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weren't so, you in a band playing that night? I was in a band at the time, a band called That's the Dancing right. Pigs, who were the second best punk band in Fife. And <laughs> there were only two punk bands in Fife. Who was the better one? Who's the, who's the better one? Oh, come on, the Skids. Oh, the Skids oh, from Fife, of course. You know, yeah, um, yeah. 
I mean, Stuart Adamson went to the same school as me. He was at Beath High School, the same high school as me, but he was about three years above me. So we never talked because, of course, if you're three years above a, a kid, you're not going to talk. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I used to go and see the skids all the time. They played the Station Hotel in Kirkcaldy, the Pogo or Gogo Club, almost every week. <laughs> And we would get into our uh, boiler suits and off we'd go down to the Pogo or Gogo Club to watch. What a great there was name. A, there, I know. And <laughs> That's there, it was, brilliant. It was basically a, a function room where they had weddings. And so there was no stage. The band were at the same level as the yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah. And it was a kind of punk disco. Uh, and then on would come the band and play. And it was just great. Anyway, let's get back to these guys because... I never saw them uh, play, right. uh, but I did interview Peter Hook when he came to Edinburgh for one of his book launches. And so he signed the back of my ticket. Uh, and what it says good. is, Peter Hook was not here. <laughs> was not here. Oh. Peter Hook that, was not here. That could just, he yeah. there so are I, get, no... I never got me £2.50 back. I hung on to the ticket. Uh, well, it's quite spent. right. And there are a number of kind of music mementos like that. Aren't, isn't there a poster? For the Hank Williams, the Hank Williams. Gig, that he was supposed to be playing on the night he died. That's right. And I think there's a poster for the Buddy Holly uh, gig that was supposed to take place at Clear Lake or whatever it was. Yes, yeah, like if the creek died. don't rise, Hank Williams will be on stage at nine o'clock. Did he say something like that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. extraordinary. I did, I did years later do a little favour for Tim uh, Burgess from the Charlatans. And so he managed to get my copy of uh, Unknown Pleasures signed by... Oh, right. The remaining members yeah. of the band. Yeah, very good. Brilliant. Yeah, very good. Every, everybody except Ian. So, yeah. yeah. So that's nice. So that's my that's my story of the gig that never was. Yeah, no, very, oh, good. very good. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. See, you you accumulate a lot of records. Yeah, and I just actually, we moved here a year ago, just over a year ago. We had a big, big Victorian house in Edinburgh. Uh, I had two or three rooms that I could store records in, a bit like Mr. Hepworth's that set up there. But downsizing madly, we had to get rid of half of everything. So half my books went, half the CDs went, and half the LPs went. So the remainder, which is a couple of thousand, uh, vinyl LPs are in this room and a couple of weeks ago I did my lockdown alphabetization uh, for the first time ever Fun. I have I have alphabetized my LPs and CDs the God, first how, did you, how did you find them before I mean if you think you, just, you, you didn't find them you found something else oh, okay. Good. <laughs> okay so <laughs> so how do, how do you resolve the Captain Beefheart issue uh, under B. C no it's B. under B B yeah, yeah. the Beefheart family but yeah. then the, the Beatles are under B they're not under T I mean, no. you know, you just, it's, you, you know, that way madness lies. No, actually, they're under M. Um, you know. <laughs> so you're uh, looking... It was a lot of fun. It was a lot you, of fun. Are you, um, are record shops opened again in, in Edinburgh? No, I'm doing a lot of mail order. I'm just, you know, I mean, like Monorail in uh, Glasgow and Asai in Edinburgh um, are doing mail order. So you can still order stuff online right. from them and he'll post it out to you right. so so my wife sadly is now apprised of how many albums i'm <laughs> buying any one week because oh, it's sick. turning up at the door <laughs> oh yeah there that would not be a you good can't idea. yeah you can't disguise it can you no, i used to one. i used to be yeah. one of those sad sacks who would leave the, the the lp purchases at the back door check if anybody was home and then rush in and slam them into the kind of slots <laughs> and so that nobody would know there were any additions it always fascinates me, this whole thing. Mark and I often talk about it when you, when you were younger, if you're in sharing a flat or whatever. And when you introduced a new record into the house, there was always that awkward procedure of, what have you got there? Yeah. Oh, this is a new record by, you've probably not heard of them, they're called whatever, the Hampton Grease Band. And they're really good. And then you had to hope to God that they would turn out to be really good. Because you've... You'd introduce them into the social circle. Yeah, you? absolutely. You're, you're going to have to live with these people for the next two, three <laughs> weeks, possibly longer. So you just pray that people are going to like. They're like your friends, aren't they? I want, I'm desperate yeah, yeah, like yeah. my friends. Well, I yeah. mean, I, rem I remember a f uh, when I shared the student flat with friends of mine from high school, and somebody brought in. Uh, it's probably Gentlemen Take Polaroids by Japan. It was, oh, it was an album by Japan, 
And we put it on and just started laughing. Because we said, this guy's just ripping off Brian Ferry. That is Even though I might have joined in with that. Brian Ferry <laughs> rip-off voice. Well, three days later, we were all fans. All right. You know, oh, well. uh, you, I mean, Mick Carnes bass did it for me from the get-go. I just thought, I've never heard bass playing like that. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And the arrangements and the, the mood and the atmosphere and everything. And eventually, you stop thinking of it as a Brian Ferry knockoff voice. And you think of it as David Sylvian. Yeah, so yeah. I love that. And at high school, of course, you know, because we grew up in a time when this is what you did, you would take your LP to high school to swap it with someone else for yes. a few days. And you would get access to bands you'd never thought of hearing, um, listening to, or albums you couldn't afford to buy. I mean, you know, money was pretty tight when I was growing up and I could probably afford to buy one LP a fortnight. Couldn't Absolutely. stop me going to the record shop and hanging around. And, and just looking yeah, at just them. Looking yeah. at just the touching point. them. Reading yeah. the sleeve notes. I know. Yeah. Well, you read them long before you heard them. That's the thing. It was, yeah. it was, a, it was a reading relationship, first of all, wasn't it? Initially. Yeah, there was that. I mean, we had, I mean, we had, um, I was just talking about this recently. I think I did an essay on Tom Waits for a, for a website and I was thinking back to when I was a kid and you, we had um, radio and it was mostly Radio 1 um and and luxembourg you would sit with this little transistor radio late at night and through the feedback and the squall and the noise and the white noise would come drifting now and again radio luxembourg uh which i like because they played the records the bbc band so if you wanted to hear hi 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 or give ireland back to the irish by wings <laughs> you, you, had, you had to get radio luxembourg um because the bbc weren't going to play them no. but we, had, we had radio and i had my newspaper of choice was sounds right i liked sounds better than enemy or melody maker because it gave you a free color poster every week and that color poster went up on my wall and the, you know my bedroom wall was just covered in posters of bands i'd never heard Proko Haram, Black Sabbath. I thought Alice Cooper was a rough looking woman. Oh, really? Uh, and until I saw him on top of the pops, you know. <laughs> then uh, you're convinced he was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Turned out he was a God fearing golf player, but who knew? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Still but, you know, so, but, so back in the day, it was like you would take your precious Genesis album or something in and swap it for Wishbone Ash. Um, or you would hear, I mean, Zappa and, and Jethro Tull and Zeppelin, I heard when I was 11 for the first time because a mate of mine at primary school, his big brother had a pretty good LP collection. And when his big brother wasn't around, we would sneak into his room and listen to his LPs. And listening to Frank Zappa was like sex education for me. Um, <laughs> you know, because the lyrics were pretty raunchy. God, what a, what a terrible effect that would have had on your <laughs> moral perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Sex education from Frank Zappa. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, I, I had no idea what groupies were, but I knew they did interesting things to the musicians they came across, if you'll pardon the phrase. No, it's, it's interesting how much, how much we just learned from listening to these records, because that was, it was like there was no internet, obviously. That stuff wasn't going to be on the television. You weren't going to read it in the newspaper. Yeah. You, you just poured over these albums, and you, you yeah. know, everything had some kind of significance to it. And later on, to make it more relevant to our conversation for me, after Top of the Pops and Radio 1, it was the Ogre Whistle Test. Oh, right. So that's where I first saw the Alex Harvey Band. It's where I first saw Tom Waits. Um, there were so many uh, musicians that you, you... If it was on the Ogre Whistle Test, it was a trademark of quality. This was God, someone the, you should be interested in. The Alex Harvey Band would have appealed to you, surely, as a, as, as a future crime writer. All that kind of gang violence and, you know... Uh, oh, yeah. wonderful. That was, yeah. that was the first album of his I had next, which is still one of my favourite albums of all time. And I did see him live. I wore my stripy black and white T-shirt and off I went to the Usher Hall in Edinburgh to see Alex Harvey around about 75, 76. Um, yeah, I, the, the, kind of, the cartoonish violence, the, the sense of theatre, um, it was like a, a really dangerous pantomime. Yeah, it? absolutely. You know, because these Germanic you wouldn't want to, cabaret. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, you wouldn't want to come across them in a dark alleyway. These guys, um, but at the same time, the musicianship was fantastic because you know Alex had got lucky. He had teamed up with a, a an already existing band. I mean, Tear Gas were a pretty tight unit when he came along and said, "Let's form the sensational Alex Harvey band," and so they were all brilliant musicians and uh, and yeah, I really got. And as you say, I mean, listen to next when you're what would that oh. be? 13 or 14. Well, you were 13, wouldn't you? That's amazing. Yeah. And you're just going, oh my God. What? Well, I mean, the opening, not the opening song, but the second song is Ain't Nothing Like a Gang Bang. 
That's right. Uh, That's you right. wouldn't you wouldn't get away with that these days. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, no. That's, a, that's a good name for an album. You wouldn't get away with that these days. Were <laughs> were the sensational Alex Harvey band? I'm not an expert at all. Were they the first big Scottish group? Oh God, no! Come on. I mean, Go they were, on. There were the poets. Uh, were around for a while. But the basic rollers, of course, were huge internationally. Okay, so um, at what point did the, the Alex the, Harvey the, become kind of known? Well, right they were across all, the UK. Well, they were well, always, what year are we talking about? Well, they were long well, before the basic rollers, weren't they? they were, 74, 75, I would have yeah. thought, was when he started oh, okay. to get biggish. Right, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, they're, but the, the big thing about the Alex Harvey band was they were known for blowing the main band off the stage. So when they supported The Who, I think The Who were a little bit nervous because these guys were going to come on and just blow the audience away. And you had to be at the mm. top of your game if you had Saab supporting you at some kind of big venue or, or music festival. Um, and they never quite became as big as they could have been, I don't think. No, I'm sure. No, I'm sure you're right. Didn't. You know, sure there, was, there was just something, I don't know what it was. I think, you know, they drifted off into pop because they started to have hits and appear on top of the pops. They started to write songs that were a bit poppier and less rock, um, like Boston Tea Party and stuff like that. Uh -huh. and, and, and Delilah, covering Delilah. That's right. You oh, know, of course. Uh, of course. At, a time, at a time when punk was just around the corner. Yeah. Uh, wasn't the cleverest move, perhaps. No, no, no. no. So much theatre. I can remember I'm seeing Alex Lyman there, him climbing up the scaffolding and hanging upside down off the scaffolding <laughs> and singing <laughs> above the band. I've never seen anything like that. Man. Yeah, and spray painting Vambo Rules OK on that. Vambo Rules OK. Oh, my God. That's and then right. crashing it through it. He would come crashing through it. It was a polished yeah. wall. Yeah. Um, yeah. The time I saw him in Edinburgh, he came, he came crashing through it dressed up as Hitler. Oh, uh, with, his, with his hair slicked back and well, a little, little moustache. Ticked every box there. <laughs> um, yeah. he, he then did have an anti an anti fascist um, rant, so it was it was all it was all fine. He, t right. he, said to, he said to all the kids in the audience, "If any fascists come to your door, just tell me, and I'll come round and punch them." <laughs> okay then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What else you got there? You got anything uh, else? What else have I got? Okay, very quickly, plug for my band. This is the band I'm in now. Right. Picture. Um, okay. Because having been in a very unsuccessful band uh, when I was 18, 19, I thought, let's repeat the process uh, <laughs> with a bunch of 50-year-olds. What are you vinyl. called again? Pink Vinyl. Uh, we're called Best Picture. Best right. Picture. Right. And this is our one and only recording so far, our single, Isabel, which came out a couple of years ago. And it's fun. It's a bunch of guys, mostly journalists, right. and who should know better. And um, the problem is that half my band are also in another band called Fat Cops. Um, oh, which, I've got all right. Which is Al Murray. Al, Al Murray. Murray is oh, the yes. Yeah, yeah. And they had an album out last year and did tours and festivals and things. So all the time that was happening, Best Picture were in abeyance. There was only me and the drummer left. So we either reformed us to the White Stripes or we just sat and waited for the rest of the band to come back to us. Uh, and you're presumably guitarist, songwriter, of singer. No, vocalist. I can't play any instrument. Oh, right. You know, okay. You know, can't play a thing. So voc vocals and, and lyrics, lyric, lyrics. That's what I do. So that's that. Um, talking to musicians I've worked with, um, to, I don't know when this is going out, but today as we record this happens to, would have been the 70th birthday of Jackie Levin. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, uh, yes. There is. Yes. Born the same day as Paul McCartney. Yep. Yes. And the same uh, day Vera Lynn died. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an album that he and I did together. Again, he was a fan of my books. I didn't know that. And he was reading on an airplane. Uh, he was in somewhere in Scandinavia on tour and he was on an airplane reading one of my books and he saw a mention for him. Rebus was listening to Jackie Levin. And he was a bit, he was bowled over. So he got in touch with the publisher and put us in touch with each other. We became good friends. And he said, look, I'm doing a thing at Celtic Connections, this big festival in Glasgow, um, music fest, but indoors, everybody seated. Um, <laughs> and, um, Scottish got festival. Quick. Got that in quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, no cues. No, yeah, no absolutely. Cams, yeah. Yeah. So, we, so we did a show together called Jackie Leave and Said. And I wrote a short story that I thought would, would, I know, would bounce off some of the ideas in his lyrics. He then wrote some new songs that would bounce off the ideas in the story I'd written. And we performed it as a one hour show. And it went down a storm and we were asked to do it again in Edinburgh. And we recorded the Edinburgh one and it came out as an album. And then because we were touring uh, with the album, uh, he phoned me up one day. He said, what do you want on your rider? I went, what's that? 
<laughs> he said, it's your backstage requirements. I went, I'm a writer. We're lucky if we get a bloody glass of water. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, said, I, I said, you're the musician, Jackie. You do the writer. Okay. So I turned up at the Royal Festival Hall in London for our first gig, sharing a huge dressing room. And his side of the room, he's sitting tuning his acoustic guitar. His side of the room, stuff everywhere. Fruit, sandwiches, crisps, nuts, sweet things, booze, towels, you name it. Salads, sandwich, yeah, everything. My side of the room, nothing. So I thought, do I say anything? At which a big backstage uh, bouncer type guy kicked open the door and said, which one of you expletive deleteds ordered a haggis? <laughs> <laughs> and Jackie pointed to me. <laughs> and I saw the rider and the only thing my side of the rider was one uncooked one haggis. haggis. Uncooked yeah. haggis. Uncooked. <laughs> You had ordered the haggis. He hadn't just supplied it as no, a... No, uh, Jackie had ordered it. He'd ordered it for you. Right. He'd, 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 he'd ordered it for you. He'd ordered it. It's that thing about, you know, the pink, the pink M&Ms or whatever, it, or the brown M&Ms. The it's, brown to M &M. see, it's to see how far the venue are Of course, yeah. yeah. See if they actually read the contract. Yeah. See yeah. if they're yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Just for good reason. So everywhere so, we played, everywhere we played at that, during that tour, there was an uncooked haggis, my side of the dressing yeah. room. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm fascinated by this this business. That it, it, is it the case that if you mention, have you written a, an awful lot of huge best-selling books? Um, and uh, and uh, is it the, the the case that if you mention a musician in them, generally a kind of obscure one, they find out about it, <laughs> yeah, it seems and to they're be the kind case. of thrilled about it? Is that is that the case? It seems to be the case, yeah. I mean, and they the presumably of, get in touch, don't they? They must do. Some, yeah, they often do get in touch, and um, and sometimes, you know, and musicians become fans of the books because there's so much music mentioned in the book. Absolutely. Um, Who else have you mentioned who's got in touch with you? Um, uh, let me think. Oh my God, I'm going to go blank. Well, I mean, most of the kind of recent Scottish bands like Mogwai, Arab yeah. Strap, get a mention somewhere down the line. Um, I've not mentioned the charlatans, but Tim Burgess got in touch anyway, and we ended up doing some stuff together. And I did some lyrics for him for the charlatans last album, I think just a little linking thing between two songs. Um, the, the stones know, um, I mean, Mick knows, Keith knows, um, Charlie knows, uh, I think they all know, um, because some of the titles of my books, let it bleed, Beggar's oh, cool. Banquet, oh, cool. yeah, yeah, black and yeah. blue. I mean, yeah. there's no surprise they're named after. Let it bleed, um, the Boston um, Strangler. Again, like another, I can see yeah, the connections. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, that, the, well, that's my favourite. Let it bleed is my favourite Stones album. Again, it was the first one I heard. I mean, it was at a time when I was into T-Rex and Slade, so I didn't really get it. It was my big sister's boyfriend who had the album. It had a wee sticker in it saying it had cost him £1.19 and eleven pence. Um, but when I was in my mid-teens, I got into Let It Bleed. And because I'm a writer, I get to meet people like this guy here. That's Keith. Oh, yes. Right. So, Wearing a sensational hat. So that's me meeting Keith. He's signing his autobiography. <laughs> and then so, so you, we're chatting you, away. In a queue, you were both signing your books. And that's me making them laugh. Oh, uh, very good. Very no, good. No, it was a private party because he's got the same oh, publisher as me. Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, and so he, it was just a private party. And my publisher said, you want to come down from Edinburgh to London to meet Keith Richards? Yes. Uh, I'm on the train and we got a couple of minutes chat but what we talked about was you were talking um, David about famous Scots uh, bands and stuff uh, before the Alex Harvey band the Beatles and the Stones both had found their members from Scotland well Ian Stewart uh, yeah. and well who uh, found the members of the Beatles I don't know was, was Stuart John Sutcliffe for yeah, Stuart, Stuart Sutcliffe was born in Edinburgh all right there oh, you go right 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 yeah because he was a founder member yeah 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 and uh, Ian Stewart was born in Pitt and Weeman Fife which is about 10 miles away from where I was born and brought up um and uh I, I so that was what I talked about with Keith I talked about Ian Stewart right right um, but he did sign my copy of Exile on Main Street, despite his manager saying, he's only signing the book, he's only signing the book. <laughs> and Keith went, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And he, and he signed my copy of Exile. So it's now, I'm interested. Don't you love the fruity way he talks? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me sign this for you now. But you, but you know, but, <laughs> but there, there are a few people I've met in my life, not many, but a few, and you just look into their eyes and you go, my God, you've seen some stuff. 
Oh, God, You've seen yeah. some dark stuff. Um, and, and he's, he's definitely one of them. There's a depth there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad I can read about his life, not live his life. Not live it, oh, absolutely. God, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can, a lot of it, not fun. Hence so, the famous uh, quote about uh, he doesn't burn the candle at both ends so much as apply a blowtorch to the middle. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> back in the day, back yeah. in the day. So I, Ian, want to, I, I want to fast forward a bit. I, let's fast forward a bit because I've got one more thing I want to show go you. On. Yeah. Because having been a great fan of music, vinyl, bands and everything else, um, having gone through university, eventually I moved to London, got married. My wife worked in London, so we lived in Tottenham. Oh, and, right, very good. Um, and I worked in Crystal, I got a job in Crystal Palace. I had the longest commute in London, oh, basically, God. 90 minutes each way. Um, and in Crystal Palace, I worked for a hi-fi magazine called Hi-Fi Review. Oh, of and course. we got to test high-end audio equipment, and we got sent tons of albums. Um, I became the jazz record reviewer because nobody else wanted to do it. And so I was getting sent dozens and dozens of jazz albums. And one day, sitting on the floor was just, you know, CDs that had fallen off desks would be lying around the floor. You guys, you've worked in the music press, you'll be used to this. And I picked one up and I thought that looks quite interesting. And it turns out to be the rarest, I think it's the rarest thing I've got in my collection. And it's a remix CD. Michael, Michael Jackson. Oh my God. Bad Lord. remixes. And it's, it's this cable company. Monster Cables, Monster Cables. Um, oh, like right. The high-end Expensive. hi-fi cables. Yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah. And, and so it's like 13 different mixes, and it was never available for sale. It was only sent out as a promo thing for Monster Cables. And, you know, and it's all creased and scratched and everything because it's been lying on the floor. And I've played it a few times, and then recently I looked in Record Collector or somewhere, and it was fetching hundreds of pounds. <sighs> I mean, not thousands, but hundreds. I don't have expensive albums in my collection. No, no. Um, they're all played to death. They're not in mint condition. Um, but that, I just thought that's extraordinary. That's something you picked up off the floor of Hi-Fi Review. It's also where I've got a pretty good Hi-Fi system. A lot of the stuff I've still got and still use is stuff that I um, got my hands on in the right. late 80s when I was right. working for a Hi-Fi magazine in Crystal, well, not Crystal Palace, Upper Norwood. <laughs> Not even as glamorous as, as Crystal, Crystal Palace. Palace. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So you finished a book during lockdown. I finished uh, the book. And, and, and when does that come out? You, when uh, do you October, have? is it? Yeah, it should be. It'll be coming out in October, and it's going to be a strange new world, hopefully a brave new world, because I don't think I'll be touring. Normally when the book comes out, uh, uh, yeah. you go on a book tour, you go to bookshops, you do f- book festivals, you people queue up afterwards they get their book personalized this is going to be online as far as i know uh, the only things i'll be doing will be things like this it'll be virtual a virtual yeah, book tour yeah. now the problem with that is you don't get to meet the fans you don't get to personalize the books so i don't know what effect any of this is going to have on book sales in the uk and and elsewhere i mean my, i think my us tour has been cancelled canadian tour has been cancelled all the festivals i was supposed to be doing between now and november uh, yeah. have cancelled I'm doing Reykjavik Noir. Reykjavik uh, Noir has not yet been cancelled. That's in <laughs> that's in November. That must really throw you because I mean most writers, you know, they have they they like both aspects of the of the process. One is sitting on your own in solitary confinement and writing, yeah, and then knowing that you're going to get out and have massive amounts of um, social intercourse. You know, with, with, uh, with, with well, I'm glad you, yes, <laughs> you pronounced that correctly. So, <laughs> yeah. Right um, uh, yeah, no, it is a weird um, Jekyll and Hyde existence. I mean, writers become writers because they enjoy solitary confinement. We like just being kids, almost like you're stuck in your bedroom at home as a kid and you just start to fantasize, you start to play role-playing games or you play with your toys or whatever. And you have these amazing creative adventures using your imagination. And that's what writers do. So we're usually happiest in a small room. You know, give me some tea, some coffee, a computer and some music. And I'm perfectly happy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, having produced the book, you have to go out and be gregarious and outgoing and entertain people for an hour, and you become more like a stand-up comedian. Completely. Yeah. And you learn which anecdotes work and which anecdotes don't. Yeah. When I yeah. started in this business in 1986, my first book came out, I had no idea how to stand in front of an audience. Yeah. And what I've learned is you learn what stories work and what anecdotes. Absolutely. <laughs> and and, and just, you, just milk, tell them again and again. you milk them today. Of course yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah. You know, very, very small anecdotes get strung out into these 20 minute monologues um, full of things that didn't actually happen. I, uh, yeah. I, I, spoke, I, I, did, I did a thing with, for you. I did a thing with Clive James about 10 years ago. And I don't know if you remember Clive James's unreliable memoirs, mm-hmm. is it? 
which had a wonderful, funny story about the Dunny Man, the man who came and emptied the lavatory. It was a really funny story. And so I interviewed him about 10 years ago. And he said, I do literary festivals and so forth. I said, what do you do at literary festivals? He said, I tell the story of the Dunny Man. You know, <laughs> Clive James has yeah. done it, did everything, wrote novels, poetry, all this stuff. In the end, he told one funny story. It, you know, that was what people remembered him. But it's the same with musicians or anybody. You have a greatest hit, don't you? They come to hear that one story. Yeah. yeah. Just the way he tells it. Yeah, I would say no, it's, it's true. It's true. And, and you know, I, I think that, that it's why comedians and maybe musicians and writers get on so well together. I mean, you know, because we are, that, there's, that, there's that performative aspect yeah. of what we do. Um, and also, we all wish we were everybody else. So writers wish they were musicians, musicians yes. wish they were actors, actors wish they were painters, painters wish they were poets, poets wish they were, and it just goes round and round and round. We all wish we were doing something else, but we found the one thing we're good at. Yeah, and yeah. it's why I like collaboration. It's why I love collaborating with Jackie Levin or doing that stuff for Rory Gallagher or when the charlatans, when Tim Burgess asked me to do some lyrics between two songs, to link two songs. It makes me look at storytelling in a different way and makes me look at narrative in a different way. And I really, I really enjoy that. I really enjoy that process. Yeah. Well, you're probably going to have to do more of that because, as you say, you're not going to be able to get out immediately and do the, I know. the normal rhythm of promotion and, and so forth. But, Ian, it's been delightful talking it's to terrific you. terrific to talk to you. It's uh, fantastic. And uh, what are you doing for the rest of the day? I'll probably, listen, I'll probably listen to some of these. I mean, I'll get, oh, some, of these, uh, get okay. some albums out. I mean, I've got a bunch of new stuff that I've got to listen to that I've just bought. So uh, I'll probably, maybe, maybe I'll have a reading day. That's what publishers uh, what a call a glorious it. day. That sounds so Yeah, attractive. publishers call it a reading day. It's when they're not in the office, they're at yes, home, reading, reading a manuscript, yeah, yeah. reading yeah. a manuscript. Yes, uh, absolutely. And listening to music. <laughs> absolutely. What, what could we better? Could absolutely. We better? It's been lovely to see you. All the so very best. Thanks Cheers. so much, Jim. Bye. Bye. Bye.